Welcome to the Four Visions Market Podcast, a space built on the principles of integrity and reciprocity. Together, we will engage in thought-provoking conversations about plant medicines, why these plants are coming out of the rainforests, jungles, and mountains after thousands of years, and what it means to be in right relationship with the ancestral wisdom cultures and guardians of these traditions. I'm your host, Mariah Ganessa, founder and director of Four Visions Market. This podcast is the natural evolution in our commitment to providing you, our tribe, with incredible resources to support you on your healing journey through plant medicines. Welcome home. Hey fam, just hopping on here before we jump into the show to share some big news. When the only thing certain in this life is that change is inevitable. One of the biggest spiritual teachings we can embrace is the ability to learn to accept change. And one of the most powerful ways to do this is to give ourselves, our visions, and our dreams permission to change and evolve as well. And that's what we've been doing over here at Four Visions recently. We have been in a huge season of growth and expansion. What started out as vending spiritual tools and plant allies in person the mornings after a plant medicine ceremony has blossomed into something much, much bigger than we could have ever imagined. Throughout our journey, we have stayed true to our mission of integrating ancient plant wisdom into the modern world by amplifying indigenous cultures. But as we grow, so too must our vision. In order to preserve the integrity of why we started this project in the first place, which is why over the next few weeks, you're going to be noticing some really big changes happening with Four Visions. Some will be obvious, like a new website, new branding, and new offerings. Others will be more subtle, but equally important, like our reason for being and our priorities as a company. Our entire mission and vision is evolving, it's deepening, it's strengthening. In order for Four Visions to step into a role of leadership as we go pioneering this emerging territory of plant medicine in the Western world. Before we roll out these exciting new changes, I want to clarify that we are still the brand that you fell in love with. Our giving back model and extremely high ethics are still the backbone of our why. In fact, it is these high standards that have pushed us to step up and grow in this way. So we want to thank you in advance for your support, for your belief in us as a brand, and for accompanying us on this exciting next chapter of our journey. So more updates to come in the coming weeks, but that's it for now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now on to today's episode. Blessings for Visions fam. Today on the show, I'm stoked to bring you a special episode with a friend of mine, Johnny Messner. Johnny Messner has been an actor producer for the last 23 years, best known for his action hero roles in Anaconda's The Hunt for the Blood Orchid, Tears of the Sun, and Running Scared, to name a few. And while you'll hear about his story of how he got to be living the great American dream, acting and producing in Hollywood, you will also get to hear an extremely vulnerable recount of Johnny's struggles with addiction and his journey to healing and recovery. For the last four and a half years, I have had the honor of witnessing Johnny's healing journey. It has been so incredible to witness a man with such heart go through this path of self-discovery and commitment to becoming a better version of himself. Johnny, like all of us, is a work in progress. And today's episode will highlight some of the turning points in his journey of recognizing his life was empty of true fulfillment and then the steps he's taking to begin healing from that place of emptiness. This is the type of episode that falls under the special category of plant medicine testimony. Anyone who is on the plant medicine path knows just how miraculous and inspiring these stories are. 
Part of our mission at Four Visions Market through this podcast is to highlight the miraculous healing powers of nature, as we believe firmly in the ability of plant medicine to heal humanity. So buckle up and enjoy Johnny's engaging story of one man's roller coaster ride back home to the heart. Okay, welcome, Johnny. Thank you so much for coming on. It's great to see you, my brother, and I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Me too. Thanks for having me, Raya. I'm stoked to be here. Um, I haven't really done many podcasts, and uh, just because, uh, not because I haven't offered them, but just because I didn't want to, and I was excited that you hit me up. So, because of you, of course, Aww. anything. <laughs> well, that makes me feel even more excited for this uh, this conversation and to get to share you, your medicine with our community. Um, I love you so much. And it's been such a joy to walk this path together over the last few years and to watch you grow and step more into your journey with the plants and with this path. So I'm really looking forward to diving into who you are and what you have to share with the world today. So, yeah, me too. I'm I'm, I'm wide open, uh, and I hope that uh, you know it resonates with with uh, with your listeners, with uh, your viewers, and it's pretty cool. Hmm. Amazing. Well, let's jump right in. You know, I, I think that a good place to start is a little bit of you know how you how you came to this path, a little bit about your background um, and your work, your life, what what your life was like before and um, you know what caused that catalyst to get you searching for something more. All right. Uh, a lot a lot of meat. Well, my life uh, before the medicine was it was good for for a, for a while. You know, I, I had the best upbringing when I was adopted, but I had the like I had the I could have picked two better parents out of out of you know all the parents and um but from the moment that i was told that i was adopted i went into fight or flight right i think it was age seven and once i hit fight or flight like the thing about adoption that i'm learning on this on this path is the heaviness that comes with it we're coming in because the, your mother doesn't get to hold you at all like they never you're never touched by your, your biological mother they just take the baby and chip, see you later. So you're coming in alone, right? You're, and then you're, you're already know you're all alone. And that's why all the babies, they actually brought me back. My parents adopted me and they had to give me back because of colic. They thought it was colic. And now they're, they're understanding that it's not colic. All these babies are crying in the orphanage or wherever it is now, you know, um, because they're not being held by their mom. So it doesn't matter who holds them. They're like, where's my mom? You know, and so you come in with, with that. So the minute that they were, I was told I went into fight or flight, right? And, and then they're not my real parents. They're not my real brother and sister, right? Cause my, my parents had kids after me think, you know, they had, they got me and then biological clock worked and, and they had their, my brother and sister. But then uh, I was like, okay, again, uh, I, who are these people, right? When you're at seven, who are these people that I'm living with? Like that's what goes through your, through your mind. Uh, everything is a lie. Uh, so that's where my life kind of started as far as my traumas that I had, to just, which started to, you know, the, the ones that were the ones that I was going to have to face no matter what, you know, and those just started to manifest. Now I was, I was one of the, I was the kind of human that had really bright light when my light was really bright. It's like the brightest light, right? It's like, uh, I'm not just, I'm not, that's not an ego thing or anything like that. It just is. It's just a super bright light. I have a very high energy and a super bright light when it's bright. But when it's dark, it's the dark. You can't see anything. It's the blackest. And and um, so I had all the advantages in life, you know, upper middle class. My dad was a colonel in the Air Force. And uh, I went to high school as a jock, you know, athlete. And uh, went to college. And and uh, the whole time um, I was disconnecting from life by from like age of nine all the way through, starting with alcohol. Um I would start disconnecting, right? Yeah, as soon as that, I couldn't deal with the pain, so I just started to disconnect. And, you know, that progressively, uh, that was like a through line of my life, right? There was always some sort of substance that was involved, uh, no matter how good it was or how bad it was. Right? None of those, that doesn't matter, right? None of that, none of that matters. And so I didn't know what I was going to, I didn't know what I was going to do in life, right? I really didn't. I, was, I thought I was going to be a sports commentator. And I had no fucking idea, to be honest, you know? And, and uh, I thought, well, I always had personality because I had to move around all the time. So you're always the new kid, right? And I had uh, the looks at, you know, I had the looks and, and uh, the charisma. So I was like, what can I use this for? 
And uh, so I'd be an actor, right? whatever, I'd be an actor. I didn't have any passion for it or anything like that, and, uh, which is a crazy thing to do when it's such a one percenter game. I don't know what I was thinking, but I didn't know what else to do. And I took the stairs, and I remember I got a soap opera. My first job was a soap opera, Guiding Light. And I was on it for like four months or six months, and I got fired because uh, I couldn't act, right? I did not act. And, uh, but when I got that job, I was bartending and I was like, I'll never bartend again. <laughs> and got to six months later, I'm in LA bartending. I moved from New York to, <laughs> to LA and I'm back to bartending. And I remember, um, uh, I was getting wasted behind the bar and, and I was getting wasted at all times basically, but it wasn't a problem yet like that. Right. It was still, still a good time. But I remember I was behind the bar. I think I was 27. And uh, in LA, and all of my peers were out there, like all these young actors and everything, you know. And uh, I was just so fucking burnt, right? I was just so I had so much envy, you know. And, and uh, so I became that that uh, real uh, asshole bartender, you know what I mean? Like, and it, it was like you were giving me a, a hard time by asking me for a drink, kind of guy, and, and and just a total prick. And then I called my dad, and I was like, you know, I I don't know what's happening, but you know, I'm turning into a complete asshole. So he sent me this book. It's called Who Moved Me? Who Moved My Cheese? It's like a 45 minute book. Right? It's about mice and men and looking going through a maze. And everybody gets something different out of the book. And I got, uh, I got that. You're never going to be successful in what you want to do until you're the best at what you're doing right now. And that was the message that I got from that book. And so I turned it around and and uh, and I said, I'm stopping drinking. I'm stopping everything except for marijuana because I'm not going to look back on life and be like. Dummy, you were right there, but this is why, right? This is what happened. You couldn't stop the, the uh, drinking and getting high. And I did. I stopped. I stopped for uh, a year. During that year, everything shifted, right? Um, within six months of that commitment, I uh, I got my first big movie, The Sweetest Thing. And it was just a comedy, and it was like the best. It was like Christine Applegate, Selma Blair, and Cameron Diaz. It's very funny. It's like a a, a, a woman classic, cult classic, because it's like, uh, it's got all the very funny humor. And then I just started to work. I got friends and then I got um, Tears of the Sun, right? And that was like my big, big break. And it was with Bruce Willis, Anton Fuqua movie, you know, it's a big deal. $90 million budget at the time. That was a lot mm-hmm. when it was 2000, you know? And, uh, and I remember I had been sober up until that movie, right? Tears of the Sun, we got to Hawaii and I was like, well, I've made it. I'm good. I can hang out party, right? And do the, go back to having a good time like that. And again, initially it was good, but I, there were so many different signs in there, you know, that you don't see because you're asleep and that's okay. But uh, basically I, I fell asleep at eight and I, I could come up every now and then for a breath of light. And then I'd go back down into this, this state of the sleep. Um, I'd have moments of clarity throughout those years um, when I didn't do the drinking and whatever, but, you know, the, the, uh, the consumption that I would always do would always be so much more than everybody else, right? It's just like, the more I can fucking disconnect, the better. You know, that was a, uh, never with any thought of death, right? Because my biggest fear this whole time was death, right? If I even had a, a snippet of the thought of death, my whole body would light up. It would be like the most insane feeling in my, it was the, the fear would paralyze me, you know? And that's why in the medicine, it took me so long for her to just keep smushing me before I allowed myself to die. It took 50 something ceremonies to, to let that happen because of the fear. Right. So I didn't have any connection to anything. I had no connection to God. Even though I prayed, I prayed out of fear. Right? I was raised in Catholicism. I didn't buy that. I needed to talk to a priest to talk to have a conscious contact with God. Never bought, bought into that. And uh, the more now about religion, I mean, I'm the opposite of all of that, but, um, but no connection to anything except fear. And what was the fear of death? It was the only connection I had to anything that uh, like that. So that would overwhelm me, but never was enough to, you know, to not go harder than everybody else. And quite a few times in the medicine, I saw, I saw how close I was, right? how close I really was to, to death, you know, to death in the physical world so many times, you know. So I got that movie and I'm there and, and it's the best time of my life. It was my parents' 40th wedding anniversary. I got to fly them out. I was a real piece of shit kid. Like all the way through, I was a real, real bad kid. So my parents, their karma to get me must have been something heavy because I was really heavy as all the way through, right? My dad almost lost a rank. The military was going to pay to send me to a psychiatric school called Defro. Uh, it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was deep. 
Uh, and it was all, all because as a child, you don't know, have any tools to process that kind of pain, right? You don't, there's nowhere for you to really put it when, you know, and there's no real right time to, to tell a child that they're adopted. You, know, you tell them that they're 13, you go, they go ballistic. They're in the, you know, you tell them when they're 20, you lied to me my whole life. Like there's just no real time. But at that point, at, at eight or seven or eight or nine or whatever it was, I remember that I didn't have anywhere to put all that pain. So I, what I, w- I would project it on the people that, that want, that loved me the most, but I didn't know, like my karma was to come into this world with all of the advantages, except for the ability to feel love. All the other advantages in the world that you got, you know, you're always going to be taken care of through life, which I always was, even in my darkest, I was always taken care of, I always had a place to live, I always had things coming, you know, and, and it was a miracle, but that was always going to be the case, right? But I was going to have to go through all this because I couldn't, I didn't have any kind of love. So the manifestation of that self-hatred started the minute I thought that I was, that my mother gave me up, right? So that started at like eight. And so that comes in and that just, you know, runs rampant if you don't address it, right? And then I didn't address it. I disconnected from it. So for a life, a lifetime of that, that thing manifesting. And then eventually what it does is it, it takes over thought on all levels and you really just can't shut that thing up, right? You can't shut down the negative self-talk. You can't shut down the circus that's going on in there. And initially the alcohol for a long time, drugs and alcohol would do that. Right. And then once I made it, right, I made it my big break. And, uh, I'm, I remember three quarters away through that movie and I'm realizing I still have, I still have a sadness about me that I don't know. You know what I mean? It's not filling this hole. I am looking for external uh, things in life to, to fill these internal holes that can only be filled by addressing it. You know, and I had no shot. Um, so I would always go to the next job. Like, oh, what, what's the next job? Right? Anacondas. She, you know, she's in Fiji. I get the anaconda. I'm drinking the whole time. Right? Again, a fist fight. Those people will never hire me again. But I don't have the sleep. I don't have the awareness that that's happening. And so, but I wasn't there for that job. I was at the next job because that was going to be the one that was bigger and better and was going to fill all these the holes that I have, you know. Um, and uh, then, of course, that never happened. Uh, what did happen was work started to slow down. You could see on my IMDb page, it's like, this guy's going to go to the moon. Uh oh. <laughs> and then it goes like this, er, er, like kind of levels out and then it starts dipping, you know, go, my stock starts. The crazy you could see the amount you could actually literally see the the addiction really starting to to take over you know and um, at the time you know I had tried all sorts of programs I've been to retreatment a ton of times you know and and, um, and I think that uh, whatever works for you is best uh, I have some I just I have a different understanding of what addiction is now and, and it's not the one that most addicts want to hear. Um, because they want to have a reason to say it's hereditary or it's handed down. The only thing that's really handed down because that gives you the addiction part is the traumas. Right? That's it. The traumas that are handed down, then you the addiction is the, is the one that you use to cope with that. But it's not like because your dad drank beers, you're drinking beers. It doesn't work like that. And to my understanding of what I uh, have been shown now, um, because it's just the, the – just the coping mechanism that everybody has, the self-soothing mechanism, which is, you know, something that I've done my whole life. I've done it my whole life, right? Self-soothing was always first, um, first on the list for, so what self initially starts as self-soothing becomes self, right? And then it just became all self, right? It just became into, you know, and no real quality relationships, right? None uh, with women, uh, just the abundance was, was more important on levels or just not a connection, not the abundance. I'm sorry. That wasn't about the numbers game or anything like that. I didn't give a shit about that. It was more about whenever I did have somebody in my life, I would always keep pushing them and pushing them. So they'd leave, right? Push them off the cliff eventually, you know, and you push a woman off the cliff, they don't come back. And that was always what my, my thing was show me how much you love me, right? I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, you need to prove it more, prove it more. And eventually like, fuck off. You know what I mean? I've, I've, I've proven it as much as I'm going to prove it that I could never see it or let it in, you know? So it was like, it was never going to be that as, and then now knowing what I announced, because how can anybody live up to the mother that I never had? 
how can they live up to the concept, you know, because boys choose their mothers. And how could any of them live up to the concept of the one that subconsciously I had built and I didn't even know it, you know? But yeah, so the, I, on the, you could see it going down and, and what was happening was is that uh, now the carnival is getting louder. No place, and so then I meet this woman and our, you know, we just meet our, where we're vibrating, you know what I mean? Wherever we are is where we're meeting. And, uh, you know, hers was low too, even though she looked on the outside that she had it all, right? Because the star of the show, Spielberg moves, all of that, right? But so much trauma, unbeknownst to me, and of course, unbeknownst to her, all of mine, right? And so then we get together and I'm asleep this whole relationship, 10 years of it. I mean, and she's trying to save me, fix me, whatever it was. And it was her codependency and my addiction. And they, it just stayed forever, you know? There was no, you know, but... There was that point, there was no connection, none forever, never, never, you know. And, uh, but then we thought that children was going to be a good idea in that kind of relationship. That's, and this is, was a very benchmark uh, thing for me on this path because the medicine showed me um, this is where ancestral trauma starts, it keeps going, right? So this is, this is part of your handoff is you're having these two children in this kind of environment and in this kind of situation and your type of shape. And it's going to now go into them. They're going to get, reap, the, reap the rewards of you, right? Um, and uh, at the time, I wasn't thinking anything about that. I didn't know anything about that, right? I didn't even know what that, that was. But yeah, so we thought that uh, children would be a good idea. And we tried forever. And then we did in vitro. And, and the boys came twins, you know. And they're the greatest ever, things ever. And, and one's high-functioning autistic. And the other one is me. There's like, God cut me right down the middle and he gave all the light to the eye for the autistic one. Rocco and Jameson ingested all of my other stuff as well as my light. But of course, he's the one that got hit with the cellular transfer. And this is one of the main reasons why um, I do the work, right? I mean, I know it's, of course, it's his path. He decides that it's perfect for him. He knew exactly who he was coming into. And, you know, there's no, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to spiritual bypass that there is a heaviness that he has. And so, so anyway, uh, we had those and, and this whole time now I am in this space of just complete disconnect, right? Complete disconnect. And now things are starting to really fall away, right? So the kids come, I go to rehab, the boys come and the minute I see them, I leave. The day they were born, I leave the hospital and get wasted, right? Because I had never seen my own DNA mm-hmm. and I was like, Mm-hmm. I am so not worthy of any of this, right? This, the unworthiness all mm-hmm. kicked in on another level, right? Not good enough. No. And you're repeating the same pattern that happened for you with the, with yeah. your mom. Same exact pattern. Mm-hmm. Same exact, right? Mm-hmm. When, and uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And that's, you know, that's how, that's how the thing keeps going. You know, that's how this whole deal keeps going, you know, and it's, I feel like we've come to a place where the children now, uh, depending on where, what lineage they have or ancestry that they have, they don't have the capacity to hold it anymore. Like there's a heaviness that's coming into, to some of the, you know, I feel like, you know, with suicides up and and just everything is so much more is heightened and with depression and the numbers are staggering compared to what they used to be. And for me, I just feel like it's because they're carrying all the weight of all of it It just keeps going down and down and down. It doesn't get any easier if there's no healing happening, right? Like if, if you're not healing in your family lineage at all, then all of it just keeps tumbling in. It's a snowball, you know, it's a snowball. So anyway, tangent. So I, I, at the, during this time now, I'm, I'm, I'm having to drink and do more drugs at that accessible uh, at, a, at a high rate of full disconnect because I couldn't shut down the noise to the level of the self-hatred that now has that come into the play, right? I hadn't looked at myself in the mirror for God knows how long, you know, and then I just left my, my sons and their mother and ended up going into like a a five year hole, right? Basically I ended up in the North Hollywood in the barrio in a one bedroom, you know, and no light in there at all. Never left. Um, Rarely only to go to the doctor to get codone. And uh, every now and then I could, uh, have enough codone where I could go do a job, right? I'd go do a job, but I'd be on codones the whole time, you know, and and, uh, and then I come back to that. So the isolation, right, on another level, 
phone stops ringing because everybody's had enough. I'm old, you know, it's not like this has just started this thing. You know, you're at that point now where I'm just going to die. I'm basically going to die in this one bedroom. That's what I saw at medicine show me as clear as day, right? Clear as day uh, that I was going to die there. And it was just a matter of, you know, not having, being so asleep uh, and never even, you know, the one of the greatest gifts that the medicine gave me is with a death that I had where I really thought I was dead, you know. Uh, I had that one bedroom in North Hollywood, right? And and uh, it was like, there was a big flat screen. It was like the smallest little living room, right? <laughs> a huge flat screen, this big couch, right? Basically the whole fucking living room. You could almost touch the TV from the couch. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was definitely a, a dive a shithole. I, I got up, remember one time I had gotten up and walked towards the TV. And in my, all of my using days, I've never glitched out. Like I've never, I've passed out, right? I've blacked out, but I've never glitched out. And right, so all of a sudden I was walking and then all of a sudden I don't, I just like, everything was like a, somebody pulled out electrical cord in my whole body and mind, right? I just fucking burn. And I was such dead weight when I fell, I fell into the sheetrock and there was a, you could fit my whole face into the sheetrock where I had fallen into the sheetrock, right? And you can see my eyes and my nose. And I don't know how long I was out. And then I woke up and I was like, what the fuck happened? Right. But I was high. I was on oxycodone thirties. I was on Xanax and I was on alcohol and that's the death cocktail. That's what people die from. Your respiratory system shuts down, right? Completely. And you just, you don't, you stop breathing. And, uh, so that happened. And, uh, and then about a year ago with, with Leo and, uh, the tiger deep in the medicine. And she says, you died already in life. Right, Johnny. I'm going to show you when, and you're, but you weren't in death consciousness. But I'm going to take you through it again, and right back to the apartment, and all of that happening. But yet, I was dying uh, in that death consciousness, and my body felt like it. And she said, "That's it." So, in my, and I, I was, you know, <laughs> I was a hundred percent sure, Mariah, that that you know, she was saying, "Ask me to remember what Avril looked like," uh, and then first of all, she said, "What's your wife's name?" And I couldn't remember. Right, and then she's like, "What does she look like?" And I couldn't see her. And same with the boys and Frankie the puppy and my, everybody. I was just like, that's it. You know, and, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. But that lesson for me afterwards, you know, when I realized I wasn't, was what was truly important. Right? What did I think about when I thought I couldn't come back? Right? Because that's what I went to right away. It's like, I'm never going back. Right? This is my purgatory. I don't know where I go from here, but I can never call or talk or see these people again, that was immediately what I went to. Right? It wasn't anything but that. It makes my life a little bit easier when I can remember because I, well, I'm a human. But uh, when things go down with people that love me, like, whatever, it's not even that deep. Right? Is this something that would really matter to me if I just got snatched away? And also that we all think we're going to die at 85 in our, our sleep. Today could be the day. You know? <laughs> there, there is no, we already have, I, I, <laughs> if it's not a morbid, my friend, I told that to my friend. He's like, that's very morbid. And I said, that's not morbid. That's like embracing the life, whatever it looks like, whatever I have left, you know, seize the seize day. Seize the day. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, I was, I was trying to, um, now I was just doing everything I could to fill those holes. And, it, and none of it was working and the alcohol and the drugs weren't working. And I was just going to die. And, and uh, the boy's mom, uh, because the boys uh, are autistic, they don't have gluten. We started them with superfoods from the very beginning, which was very lucky for us. Well, not lucky, but yeah. Uh, so they never had gluten. So they would go to the farmer's market at Silver Lake, and uh, there was a gluten-free empanada stand. And they get my, the cat, the kids, she got to know the, the, the empanada woman because the boys loved them. And then she's just, they started talking about me on some level. And then she, her brother had just done the documentary, The Medicine, and Rhythmia was in there. And she said, call Rhythmia. And so she called Rhythmia. And then Dr. McNary had kind of known me through the circles of addiction. And uh, he's like, yeah, come on down. And so the week I was supposed to be there, I got thrown off the plane for being drunk. I didn't really feel, I didn't really follow the diet that well. <laughs> and, and I called him and I said, I just got thrown off the plane for being drunk. He's like, oh, cool, dude. Come next week. You know? And so I made it next week. And I stayed there for two weeks because Taita came the second. And on this Thursday night, after two weeks of the heaviest 
medicine, um, I cracked. You know, I went into uh, my, I was Catholicism, believed there was a heaven and hell, and, and she was uh, obliged taking me right down to, to the, the hell that I always thought there was and let me know that I was never coming out. And, uh, and then I remember uh, uh, Carlos was with me, you know, and, and, uh, and then all of them, and they all I started freaking and they tied me down, down the, uh, in the Maloka. And uh, Taita came over and did a tobacco healing on me. And I remember getting up from that and Carlos was saying, you know, God is, God always loves you. You know, it's never been a question. And I was like back to my five-year-old self and, and I saw, you know, that we're eternal beings and how beautiful life really is and what it's all about. You know, how she does that. She's, she's very, I'm trying to look for the right word because I don't want to ever offend her, but she, she, uh, what is the word I'm like she gets you because what she does when you first do the work like in the first like I don't know a week or two weeks of doing the deep medicine work she cracks you so wide open to all like she lifts the veil to a place and you're just like oh my god I can't believe it all oh, everything I thought I knew was wrong and like you, you know you, you realize that you're one conscious like all of it you get all of it right and then when you when you're on the path path and and you're really going to do a deep study with her. Uh, she's like, well, all right, now you saw it, right? But now we got to do the work. <laughs> now you got to do the work, Johnny. You know what I mean? That was the good stuff, right? You will get to that. But that is far and few between, right? You got to go with it. You got to, we have to dig in now. You know, and I really like that. I like that about it. The way that she, uh, you know, does that, does that, have, does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, she has a way of making sure that we don't avoid things, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so what was the, what was the turning point that caused you to get on that plane? Cause you were obviously, you know, still deep in the addiction, you drinking as you were going down there, but what made you say yes? What made you say that there's gotta be a different way? I'm going to try this new thing that I'm just hearing about, um, because I want help. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. I think it was right away. I did. I thought like, if I die in addiction, what's going to happen to the boys, right? And then what happened? I still had the, some sort of clarity about that, even though up until recently, I, I hadn't been able, I hadn't seen my sons, right? I hadn't, I, I hadn't seen them. I couldn't look at them and see them, right? I just didn't know what they, I couldn't, I couldn't see me and them. I had no capacity to see that. But I knew that I always wanted to live and I always tried, right? It wasn't like I would get into this. It would be like I would be I, my whole life. I was always like so, something wants me dead. Right? Something definitely wants me dead because I would go into this space of darkness, right? And then I would crawl my way out and I'd come up for a big breath of light. Uh, and then it would drag me back down there, you know, and then I'd come up. So I always was a fighter um, with it. And then I just remember, though, that um, – uh, I looked at my, of course, I looked in the mirror. I was like, just a 260 pound bloated disaster. Like, I looked like I had eaten myself. And I never could even look in the mirror. And I just, everything about what I saw, I already didn't like, but I just knew that it wasn't going to last. Right? It wasn't going to last. I wasn't going to last. You know, and there's days that in that deep addiction, though, that you, I never once said that I don't. I would kill myself, right? I would never do that. I'm no one too much of a coward to kill myself uh, on that level, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but there was, you know, few, quite a few moments where it was okay if I didn't wake up, right? I would go to bed going, Meh, it's okay if I don't, you know. Just another act, though, of selfish, right? Self, my whole life, always got into self, 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 you know. And that would have been, again, the coup de la gras on, the, on all of it, right? I said, so self soothing to the point where I'm so in self that I, I take my own life and then my sons are without, right? And they have to carry that weight. Um, and so I, at that moment, I, 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 I would do anything to, to heal, right? To, to, to get out of this, whatever that look, whatever that took. And that, that was one of the greatest assets I had about going in and doing the medicine was I didn't have any idea what it was, mm -hmm. right? Except for I, 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 it had come to me uh, a couple years earlier and I said out loud, I want to try that, right? I want to try that. That was it. 
I didn't know much about it. I just knew it was hallucinogenic. I didn't know about the purging. I didn't know anything. Uh, and so when I went to to drink medicine for the first two weeks, uh, I didn't have any expectations. I just wanted to live. I wanted to. I wanted to change. I wanted. I would. I just wanted anything to change, and I would do anything to get there. Mm. So beautiful. I want to just thank you so much for sharing so authentically and honestly. And your whole story is so inspiring, Johnny. And for, I think for all of us, regardless of whether or not we've struggled with addiction to substances, these elements that plagued your early journey are so relatable to anyone who's walking any sort of path, you know, because we're all tempted to go deep into that hole of darkness. We're all tempted by our own darkness and that's part of the human experience. And so I'm just receiving so much from your sharing and uh, it's such a story of resilience. It's such a story of brilliance and, and overcoming and, you know, finding that light. Like you said, you know, you know, and you've always known that when you shine bright, you, you shine and illuminate. And so to be able to recover that is a true story of victory, you know, and Mm. really, um, I'm so grateful to be here talking to you today and to be, you know, knowing you and where you are at this phase in your life. It brings me so much hope and really just, um, fills my heart with with joy to to know that these stories exist and that um, through the plants and through a reconnection with the force of life, we as humanity can heal. We can overcome some of the darkest wounds of the deepest separation that so many of us have experienced in a multitude of facets just from the experience of living as humans in this life, right? Um, so thank you so much. It's so, so beautiful. And uh, I really am so touched, you know, to hear a little bit more about how your sons played this pivotal journey in you getting on that plane. Because, you know, for me being a parent, when I became a parent, everything changed. And, you know, hearing your reflections, I think on some level that was the case for you too, even though first you kind of went backwards. But at the same time, it was your children who were inspiring um, first, you know, the step backwards and then the ste- all the steps forward since then. And so I'm curious, you know, to hear how your parenting journey has shifted and changed as you've worked with the medicine and, you know, how you show up for your boys in this new version of yourself and any other insights that you've received on this concept, you know, of generational trauma. There's really so much to unpack in this unique circumstance of your of your life because through your children, you're also healing so much of your own um, story with your with your parents and, and how you came to be here in your journey of adoption, which I'm sure you are aware of because we're all healing through our children, right? They are our greatest Mm -hmm. teachers and catalysts for our spiritual growth. And they always come to teach us and to inspire us to be better and to grow. And so I I definitely see that that has taken place for you. And I'm just curious, you know, how your relationship with them has evolved, the ways in which the medicine has supported you in showing up in a different capacity uh, for your children. And especially, you know, with the autism journey, which is a whole unique journey in its own of how to meet that with a level of consciousness and connection with life to be able to support your children and their uniqueness of achieving their full capacity. So anything you feel called to share on that topic, I'm all yours. Yeah. You know, it's, I just want to say quickly, you know, Mariah, you've been there for almost all of it for me. You know what I mean? Like you, we've been, you've been through this, my, my whole evolution so far and i'm so grateful that that uh, you were you're a big part of it so mm. it's amazing how this thing works it really is blows my mind all the time never once to die you know <laughs> um yeah i i had zero relationship with my sons for their first six years of their life maybe six and a half i was so deep in in uh disconnect i was dead asleep um, um, but, uh, um, the more I started to do the medicine, uh, the more healing that, that I was, uh, w- that was happening for me, um, you know, the connection and the, for, for you know, it's patience for me is like, uh, is, 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 has never been a virtue. Um, and, uh, that's shifted drastically, you know, and kids, they, they, you, you have no choice. We well, have choices, but 
the, 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 the right choices, you know, the learn patients quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> that's the way it works. But it's interesting because their mother is such a rock for them, you know, cause she's been with them the whole time. And so it's almost like I'm the calming factor now on levels, you know, uh, when I see them, you know, so we're going through, uh, doing a custody thing right now, you know, which is something that I never thought was going to happen. Like all of these things that were never even thought about. Right? And even at the, in the, in the thickness, I didn't even think about, I just thought the boys with their mom, they're going to be good. Right. Not even thinking about the damage that's occurring <laughs> because I'm not there. Right. And they're like, just totally disappeared. Uh, the immense amount of from the zero to seven range that these kids are adjusting that I know that they came for, but fuck, I'm a part of it, you know, and, 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 uh, not having that understanding of any of that. And that's the thing that, um, is really important to me and has taught me is they don't know better because they're asleep, right? Like we don't know better on these things a lot of times because we're asleep. We don't. It doesn't register. We don't even have the understanding of it, you know? So it's why for me, it's like always been about, I need to learn gentle and I'm still deep into the gentle study, you know, because I'm very, uh, uh, I can be intimidating, right? And I don't realize how big my energy can be. And if it's, when it's bright, it's bright. But if I shift it a little bit, it can be very disruptive to people. You know? <laughs> That's just who I am, right? It has that abruptness to it a lot of times. And so it's not gentle. And all that keeps showing me is I'm not being gentle on me, right? I'm still in the process of learning how to be gentle on myself. And I think that happens when your whole life you're trying to prove yourself, right? So it's not an easy fix but that gentleness that the medicine is teaching me it works really well with my sons right they don't respond to the other uh, you know um, <laughs> uh, jameson he's the he's the little mini me right the other day he has a very love and i'm not going to say hate but a tremendous tumultuous relationship with his mother right because that's the way their relationship is and he can be very mean Right, it can be mean, and I see. See, I see the things that uh, that I used to do, right, because of the abandonment. And then he has the abandonment of of me not being there the further like all, all the time and levels, and also uh, nannies, right, because Catherine can be uh, she can be um, specific. So they've had a lot of nannies. Right? They've had like four, 12, 14, or nine, you know. So they come and then. They have this connection to them and they go. There's a real deep connection to nannies. There's not like a, having one is the best, right? So they, he has that. So I see the actions and I see how he knows. Because children will use any – they're so much smarter than we, we have any idea, right? They'll use – they know exactly what to do to manipulate or punch your buttons. They're going to do it. If you don't have the boundaries with them, they are going to keep pushing those buttons as far and, – and pushing and pushing and pushing. And that's what their relationship is like, right? But he's getting physical, you know. But so the other day, I I was gentle, but I could have been gentler. But it's the uh, you know it's the he, I'm trying I'm st- I'm still learning what he responds to, right? What what does he respond to? Because I said, dude, I'm going to come over there because if he hits his mom, is it's a problem. It's a big problem. So I said, dude, I'm going to come over there and whoop your ass if I hear that. And he goes, nah, you're not going to. This is what he says the other day. He's on a FaceTime with me, right? He's, and he goes, nah, you're not going to do that. And I go, why, why am I not going to do that? He goes, you say it all the time. Bro. He's like, you say it all the time, but you never do it. And, I saw, and then he, this is exactly his like words. So I'm going to keep doing this until you do. Right? Ask, so, asking for boundaries. <laughs> asking, asking for boundaries. Asking for discipline and boundaries. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So it's, you know, but it's, like I, t- like I said earlier, I can see them now. Right. I'm like, it, it, you know, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, it, cause most people wouldn't understand, could never understand. Like when you see your baby being born, part of you being born, 99.9% of the world are like, Oh my God, like the love factor. And the, like, it's like uh it's like a whole different thing. You know what I mean? It's like you know, for most humans, it feel like it's a connection to love that they never experienced until that moment. Right. I didn't have that. I didn't have that connection, right? Uh, it was the opposite of that. And so being able to see them changes everything because then it's so much easier to be gentle. 
right? It's so much easier for me to be gentle on them, you know, because I'm not seeing all the bar- bad parts of me anymore. Right? Not enough, not doing enough, right? You know, because initially my parenting strategy is always, you know, keep pushing. But that wasn't, that's not the parenting strategy. You know, the medicine, as far as parenting goes, and then what the medicine has, has given me is a whole different perspective on it, you know. And when I'm going through my, I'm doing my healing on my side ancestrally, I got a real heavy duty one. I went to see my biological mom, right? You love this, right? It's Gabby, um, who uh, lives in Florida. I went to do shoot a movie there for a, a couple of days. And so I went to spend some alone time. I'd never spent any alone time with her, just with Avril and then with uh, the boys and their mom. And so I get there. And so in this whole healing journey for me, since the very beginning, the first two weeks of Rhythmia, there's been a bunch of Third Reich and stuff, like uh, very specific, very heavy duty Third Reich stuff, right? Uh, tortures and rape, all of the, the thickness of it, right? The real darkness. And then when I went to Sachawasi for the first time, the medicine took me into the pure evil consciousness. And it was the most overwhelming thing. And I, it, was, it was the heaviest thing that I've ever experienced. I didn't even know existed that kind of heat, uh, that kind of darkness. And I thought it was because I was my biological mother's German Jew. So I thought it was the Jewish side that I was healing, right? Because there's a bunch of, obviously, Third Reich. So now I'm back with uh, my... Uh, my mother and I'm like telling her about this. She's understanding about the journeys now and everything and what it, what's healing. And she said, no, 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 that's not what happened. Johnny, your grandmother, her mother, right. Was in Berlin during the war. Her husband traveled for business all the time. And so she was promiscuous. So when he was gone, she had an affair with a SS commander. And that's how Gabby came. My biological mom came. Wow. So not only did she, yeah, it's crazy. Is that crazy? I mean, I'm like, what the, what did I sign up for? Who, what was I even thinking? But yeah, so that's the, and that was like, so that's only two generations moved from, you know, from, from me. Uh, and that's what all that is, right? All of that, that heaviness is that. But going up that line, right? Going up the both, both sides and, and seeing, but when I was in that that deep state in, in Satawasi, she was showing me how the trauma and darkness works, right? And when uh, it is invited in through a family, through somebody in your family, on whatever level that is, right? it all starts has to start somewhere. And once you cross that that boundary, that border of that into that bringing that darkness in, it's almost like then you owe a debt on some level, right? Because then it just starts to use it, starts to just go. It's, it's what the medicine said to me was that my family were good earners for the darkness. That's what she said. My family mm-hmm. were good earners, right? And so the darkness doesn't want to let go of that. So it just keeps going generation to generation. So my biological grandmother uh, had a twin, the one that had the affair, had a twin sister. She was raped and uh, by Russian soldiers, right? Ended up killing herself, right? And then my biological mother, uh, beaten for her a lifetime, right? Um, from her, uh, husband, you know, the beaten by my biological death and all the way to, you know, when it stopped, which was late in life, her brother, uh, drug addict, uh, kids, kids, all drug addicts. Her sister died cancer of 42. Right. So it was showing me how this all works, right? You ingest it and the traumas they build and they get handed down, they get handed down until somebody breaks it. Right? And so somebody starts to do the healing for them on themselves, just on their own mm-hmm. uh, healing, and that's the beginning of the of the of the break of that trauma, right? And and so every time I I, I have to get up to take another cup, I always go, uh, do, you know, right away, like I don't, I'll do anything not to do it except for I'll think about Jameson and and Rock. Oh, oh, what am I? It's not even a question uh, mm-hmm. because we, you know they. Uh, because the more that I'm healing, my relationship with them is growing immensely, right? The connection is, is becoming something I didn't even know existed. And it just, uh, it just makes it so, um, so easy. It makes it easier. It's never easy, but it makes it easier just to get up and and do this work, you know, because our kids are in for a, it's going to be kooky by that time. It was already being kooky now. Oh, Mariah, it's getting mm-hmm. kookier out there. You know, <laughs> we need to give them mm-hmm. all the light they can get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm praying for it to be better than now. 
for sure, but it is quite the journey they have ahead of us, them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Look, Johnny, this is so beautiful. I love that you've had this opportunity to connect with your ancestry because it is key in the healing journey. What a gift that you have been able to have those relationships and just get that information because a lot of adopted people never are able to recover that information. And so they have to do a lot of this work, this ancestral healing work abstractly and connecting through uh, different ways, right? And so you being given this roadmap is so epic and such an incredible gift for your healing journey because you're literally being given the blueprint of exactly what you need to work on. And so what a what an incredible blessing um, for you and so beautiful to hear these stories and ancestral work always never ceases to amaze me the way yeah. in which we are such puzzles and once you start to put together the pieces you understand so much more about yourself and what make why you are the way that you are and like we all know blood runs deep and the a story of adoption is so fascinating too because um, we get to see you know the perfect example of um, what is conditioned and what is uh, inherited and the ways in which we are connected to our ancestry on such a profound, deep level that we can't shut it out and we can't um, move it to the side, right? So like we have to face it. We have to acknowledge it to the extent that we have the capacity. Some of us don't have living ancestors or living elders who we can go to to ask the stories. And that's why, you know, for me, I'm always trying to soak up as much as I can from my living grandparents and getting them, asking them, begging them to tell me the stories um, because I don't know how many more years they have left. And so for me, it's like to be that archive of the stories of my bloodline is such an incredible uh, gift is not even the right word for it, right? Because it literally is the the book of, of our bloodline, of our ancestry that we get to then share with our children. We get to give them these tools, this, these understandings. For me personally, these understandings of who I am and where I come from have probably been the biggest piece in my healing journey of understanding my even my neurological makeup, you know, and why I've made the decisions that I've made and why I lean towards the certain um, things that I go towards and why I lean away from the things that scare me, right? So it's it's such an incredible uh, roadmap that you've been given. And I just encourage you to keep going because it's, it is never ending, right? And it, it's like more layers that we can peel back the more that we're given the inspiration and the courage to keep healing and keep doing the work to better understand the people that we want to become for our children, the legacy that we want to leave on this planet once we depart. And it becomes so much greater than ourselves, which I think is like a big theme of what you've been sharing about this whole time with your journey is like your healing journey, your search for the light was bigger than you. And that was truly the the key that unlocked the door to get you out of the darkness and bring you towards a path that was going to sustain you and bring you joy and uh, focus and clarity and a new life, essentially. So I um, really just applaud you and celebrate celebrate your story as well as just giving thanks for these tools that we're given, you know, these these roadmaps that allow us to perceive into our our own makeup and literally utilize it for the evolution of our consciousness and the collective consciousness. Yeah, it's uh, exactly right. I mean, you know, really I had I have the two most loving parents that you could ever like ever. Like nobody meets my parents. They're still alive. They're still together at 63 years. Uh, and and doesn't say you have the best parents, the sweetest parents, right? That's just who they are. But it doesn't matter how much love or sweetness that they had to offer. It was never going to to uh, shift my trajectory of life at that, from that point on, right. From that moment on, it was already set, right. I was already off to the races and, and um, it just, it shows you like as parents, we can make sure that our kids always feel safe and they know that they have uh, are loved and we can try to give them our wisdom if they're ready to hear it, uh, if they can hear it or even want to hear it. But really they're on their own. They got the things that they came here to do and to work out and, 
And, um, you know, so I, and something that really struck a chord with me recently was that somebody said, once kids leave the house at 18, the amount of time that you see them for the rest of your life is like a year total, Mm -hmm. a year, right? So these times, uh, are the ones that as parents that we, we, you know, we, I, we really need to savor because, and that's not that long. It's not much time at all, Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, it's, it's been, the the roadmap and 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 the the it's funny you know because the coming so full circle now teaching at really like when I teach and I work with Mom Bay when I teach even though they tell us not to because I don't care about that thing sometimes I get in trouble but then I just move it to the side a little more but I will be using the Mom Bay when I'm when I'm up there and I get to be an observer of me teaching or answering questions and things and the answers are something that I don't even know. Right. Like I don't even like they're just, just channeled right in. It's it's like I, I can like kind of sit back now and watch that happening. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> what the fuck? Who the fuck is up here right now? You know what I mean? Like, who is this talking? And and the fact that May 2009, my 50th birthday. Right. I was in Romania working on a movie with Steven Seagal. And I was alone at the bar on my 50th. And I think my parents might have hit me up and the boy's mom on my 50th. Right? And a month later, I was at, I was at Rhythmia. A month later from that moment, you know, uh, to think about where I was then to where I am now. It's so much, you know, the minister told me a long time ago, whatever, think about your wildest dreams, whatever those are times them by a thousand, right? Like that's, you know, just keep doing this work, keep showing up, follow the path that's presented to you that I'm bringing towards you. Keep doing that work and the the external world and all the rest of it. And just, you know, just relax. Right. Mm -hmm. And it is, she, you know, she, she is the most wise. And I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not like I went to rhythm of those two weeks, right. Got cracked open and then everything went went a okay. I had to go back in and do more research, right? And then and take my wife my wife with me, right? So she had to go into the darkest spaces that she's ever seen in her entire life for her own reasons, whatever those are, you know. But I just kept showing up, right? No matter what, when the medicine called, she said, "I'll call." And no matter what, you'll never have to worry about the means or whatever. It I'll make them available, and really. For those four years of going in and out like that, that's exactly what happened. Whenever she called, I had the means. I, you know, I, 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 when I worked with you, I worked with you guys a lot when we were in the States. The like COVID years were a lot of work done. Mm-hmm. And uh, I always had the means, right? I always had the time and the means. And I just kept doing that. I uh, kept showing up. And even though I'd go back down to the darkness, I'd still come right back, you know, and it started getting lower and less and less. And, and she had told me that the, they're all going to fall away, Johnny. Don't worry about it. It's going to start with the last one in and go to the first one in, you know. Mm-hmm. And then it took about three years for the spirit of alcohol to finally take a hike, you know. Mm-hmm. And it was that death that I had. The purge that I had on that night was like a million volts of electricity coming out of my body. And I could see something mm-hmm. coming out of my my face, right? And I was like, oh my God, Mm -hmm. it was the craziest purge ever. And that was it, right? That was the moment, that death that I had. Alcohol finally left. Wow. Wow. That's beautiful. So, so epic because, you know, the spirit of alcohol is is so dark. And so to have that unique moment where you feel that it's gone, it's like a whole, you're reborn, you know, it's a new chapter for you. It's like, beautiful. it's like, uh, uh, I can't even fathom it now. Like before it was always, mm-hmm. uh, you know, okay. When I, I mean, I would even say something like when I'm 70, I'm going to have a drink or whatever. Right. Like that's, uh, I won't drink now, but when I'm 70, right. Just to give my brain, uh, that sense of, uh, eventually, you know, I can't even, it's like, I even think about it. And I think about wine in the glass. And when I go to put it to my lips, like, it's like, I'm taking a bite of the glass. It's like, uh, there's like absolutely nothing about it. And you're right. It is the lowest vibration and it's what keeps everybody asleep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I do yeah. all this hard work in there. I'm not trying to, to <laughs> you bring it all the way back down. You go in to do the medicine for to go to this deep work and then you go out there and you bring it right back down and you're like, Oh man. Mm-hmm. 
you know. Yeah, you know, people people ask me a lot why we keep drinking medicine, why we keep going back. Like if it's if it's so good as what we're saying it is, why do you need so much of it? And I think that your story is an incredible highlight of how we can utilize the medicine to continue our healing journey as well as our spiritual studies, right? Because like you've been sharing in some different moments in this interview, how you've been given these profound insights into healing trauma, what trauma is. And so the healing journey, first, obviously, we spend a lot of time healing ourselves and focusing on ourselves, but then comes this really beautiful chapter and the healing on ourselves doesn't end, right? But there comes a new chapter where we are able to do these spiritual studies through the medicines and through the communion with nature, through these ancestral wisdom plants that just is so beautiful and gives us this this opening into you know that that consciousness that you spoke of when you when you're feeling like you're channeling and you're connecting to these higher frequencies and this capacity of wisdom that you know is beyond Johnny right yeah. and so this this is the wisdom that this planet needs at this time and so the answer is so clear to me you know we keep drinking as long as we keep getting something out of it as long as these medicines continue serving in our evolution and in our ability to be in service to the planet and our ability to continue doing this work, right? So I, I love this and I'm just, it's so, so cool to just get to talk to you and hear these reflections. You are now working in a, in a capacity of service with the plants. And so I wanted to ask you about that because I know that that was, you know, a shift for you. And um, again, like really highlighting this natural evolution, as you mentioned, with when we receive so much from, from these plants, from these cultures, this natural inclination nation to want to support other people on their journey. And it's not to say that we're, you know, we've healed, right? And we've got it all figured <laughs> out. We're, we're obviously very much still walking this path and learning our lessons and integrating them, right? But there's like this, this beautiful thing that happens where we start to come out of the me and focus on the we. And for you, you know, you've shared your journey and the past has been one of such selfishness or focusing so much on Johnny. And so I feel like this is a big element of your journey that I would love to hear you share a little bit more about now that you're, you know, working at Rhythmia, you're helping a lot of people and ultimately, you know, you're playing a role, you're playing a part in many people's healing journeys. And so tell us a little bit about that and what that's been like for you. I, the, first of all, I, I'm always so humbled by it, right? It's, it's very humbling to me and the honor, you know, the honor that I feel like I'm, I've been working really hard to shifting whatever fear, doubts I, and worries that I have when I get into the medicine work sometimes to a place of um, honor. Like I'm so honored. Like it's, you know, the, every cup that I take, I was, I, I signed up for, it, right. I signed up for it. You know, I'm trying to, to have the same philosophy on life. Like, uh, Eckhart, I just saw something Eckhart Tolle said recently is like, if something's coming in life at you, uh, it's already coming. Right. So you can either look, you can look at it like you chose it. Uh, and then it shifts the perspective like, Oh, this is something I chose. I needed to figure this out, whatever it is, uh, with the understanding that this is all for me. And, uh, it's quite the practice, though, to do that. I tell you, <laughs> you know, because when things start to go shitty, they go. You're like, what the fuck is happening? You know what I mean? You don't get to the place of, oh, I wanted this. You know, you gotta find that place. But uh, the fact that I remember specifically, uh, I was uh, at with me in the Yahe, and I was laying next to Jerry and Doctor McNary, and they're funny to do medicine next to you know, and, and uh, Doctor McNary's cup has a false bottom, you know, it's like this much and <laughs> um and uh uh we went up for i went up for a private healing with mitra uh with those two and uh i was sitting on the th over here jerry's over here Mitra's doing the healing on jerry and dr venary and the medicines uh, give me a consulta you know, she always does that and they're i'm so grateful it's like when a healings happen it's like she's always like good fucking job johnny look at you you know like that's when she gives me the you really, you know, you keep showing up. Like she pep talks me uh, every healing that I get, you know, letting me know where I am and how great I am doing and all that good stuff, right? So I was in that moment. She's consulting with me and and um, she said, uh, 
you know, because I never, uh, Mariah, I never loved acting. That's why I was such a mediocre actor. I didn't love it, right? I still don't don't love it. I'll do it if it's a cool people and it's a cool role, but otherwise it's whatever, you know, it is what it is. Uh, But she's like, okay, Johnny, so I'm going to, uh, I'm in the healing. She's like, I'm I'm so proud of you. She's like, so what I'm going to do, Johnny, here's what's happening now. Your path is starting to open. I know that you're, you know, you know that you're going to be of service. Um, And so I'm going to, I'm going to show you what I need you to do. I'm going to show you what's next. And it won't be something that you even have to, it won't be any question about it. I'm going to knock you over the head with it. That's the direction I need you to go. And literally, this is what she says to me. And I'm like, well, of course, I'm in such a deep state of healing. I'm like, of course, anything you want, you know, whatever it is, I'm, I'm doing it. And, and, and of course, that's the case, you know. Uh, and, uh, and then we get back to the mats. And then I'm sitting in front of my mat next to Jerry's, uh, sitting up. And then 10 minutes go by or whatever. And then he sits up and he says, dude, I really need you to start teaching here my Mondays, you know. And it's very important, to, you know, you have a special quality, Johnny, about you that only you bring to the table. And I, we need that here. You know, this is, the things are different when you're here. And uh, I was like, oh, shit. Because <laughs> he had just said that to me. And I was like, I'm going to pound you over the head with it. And then 10 minutes later, dude is popping up and saying, I need you to teach here. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, of course. So, I mean, uh, that's how it started. It just started like um, – hmm. She told me, and, and then I knew, and and um, and everything is just aligning towards it, right? I, that's the thing that's beautiful about this work. I feel like is if you really are working from that highest self place, so you, even if it's only in the medicine, and then you see the direction you need to go as highest self, and then you still take the initiative. It's not like you're walking in highest self the whole time, but you're in highest self. Highest self tells you to go this direction, and then in physical, you go that direction. It seems like things, that's nothing's perfect, but things just start to align up where to make it happen, right? Where it can, it, it, it makes it so it's feasible. Mm-hmm. And so now that I'm, when I'm there, you know, and I, it gives me a chance to act because I do Jerry's story as Jerry at first. He's like, no, I don't want you to fucking do that. <laughs> and, and then I'm like, but I'm an actor, dog. Let me do it as you. And so I do it as him. And, and uh, so I get to act, right? Every time I'm there for a, a class, it's like an acting one man show for me there. But um, so get that fix of that, and but I've never been in a job, Mariah, anything, and and I've really had a, a up until even though there was a bunch of darkness throughout my lifetime, there was very very amazing moments. Not like I've had a shitty life; I had a really good life for you know up until a point. It was incredible, right? It was like the best life, and it's all your wildest dreams come true kind of life. And then, but nothing is as uh, fulfilling as helping shepherd these people through their process, just being there to hold space and, and give them the tools that they need, uh, that they, that they hear, you know, I'm always surprised when they come back later in the week and they're like, remember when you said this, when I was in the medicine, this really stuck with me, right? This helped me get to this place, whatever resonates with them, right? Uh, to be that small little piece of helping them get through all that fear, doubt and worry, and come out the other side, you know, finish the program strong and, and be, and heal like that. I mean, you know, it's like the work that we do, there's more healing with what we do than anywhere. Right. And, in uh, week in and week out, like that kind of heavy duty healing, where are you going to find that? Right. There's no, you know, I just there every two weeks. It's like, it's the most incredible setup right now. <laughs> it's like, I'm so grateful to be there. Not only that I get to drink with him every Every time I'm there, basically, and that's you know, it's always a a, a a plus. You know, I'm I'm always so grateful for that, and and I'm you know I'm, I'm finding it, oddly enough, you know, I hated school, right? But I'm a really good fucking teacher, right? I re, I'm because re, I I guess the performing helps, right? The performing aspect of it helps, uh, and I'm honest, right? And I'm authentic, and it's not always as gentle as it should be, and I'm learning, but. It's just my authentic self. And in, in, in order for me to be authentic and teach and do these things, um, I, you're going to have to grow with me, right? Because I, I haven't been doing this for 20 years, so it's growing pains all the way through, which is better, I feel like, that I'm authentic about it. And then I always have no problem going, oh, I'm sorry about that or whatever it is, you know. Uh, better to mm-hmm. ask forgiveness than permission. 
um, kind of thing, you know? And so I'm, uh, the, the response that I get to be a part of, and then not only that, but everybody, like the, my relationships with like, you know, you and the, the, the Titan medicine family, and then the Rhythmy and the Rhythmist family. And these are like, it's like my family family. Like I didn't, I didn't have any under, understanding. I mean, of course I know my family is the best family, but besides that, outside of that, uh, I didn't have that sense of that kind of compassion and patience and love and forgiveness and understanding and, and, uh, the, uh, availability, you know, and, and, uh, the love that comes with that is something, uh, that I didn't even know existed. Right. I didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this such an, um, so grateful for, uh, for this whole deal, man, I couldn't, I can't, you know, I, there are many moments where I, when I, I, I go, you know, because my brain has a thing where it doesn't allow it in still on levels, you know, but there are, mo but I have many more moments now, like in breath or whatever, that I can actually let it in, you know, let it in all the work that I've done, like congratulate myself. Cause that's always been a hard thing for me to do. Right. Is to, to say, fucking great job, dude. You know what I mean? I have to get it from other sources. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't necessarily do it myself, you know, a hundred percent. Uh, but why I do have those moments now and I look back and I go through like, whoa. I mean, incredible. Love it. It's so beautiful. Thank you. That's why we're here, huh? Yep. Good yep I stuff. couldn't do it without you, lady. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love walking this path together. And thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your beautiful story with us. It's been a pleasure. Is there anything else that you feel called to leave us with before we go? Just want to quickly say how grateful I am really, though, to to everybody that I work with, you know, and, and everybody that shows up and, and the medicine families that uh, week in and week out do this work beyond uh, so above my uh, capacity, capacity, like I you know, and then they'll let me uh, assist in the Maloka for one night, you know, good with that. Uh, but no, the, the and the level of patience and understanding and compassion and forgiveness and love that I I get shown on a cons on a consistent basis again every time you know really uh, is I'm so grateful to be able to learn uh, all of those those um, incredible assets and, and characteristics that 99.9% uh, .9 of people don't have you know and uh, I mean really human angels on all levels. So I'm so grateful for you guys. Hmm. I'm grateful for you too, Johnny. Keep shining your light. Thank you for being an inspiration for us all. Hmm. From everyone at the Four Visions Market family, we would like to thank you for listening to our podcast. We really hope that you've enjoyed the conversation and gained many new insights on plant medicines, ancestral wisdom, and much more. Please remember to visit our website at www.4visionsmarket.com for more resources and information on plant medicine and spiritual tools. And please don't forget to follow us across social media for regular updates on upcoming episodes. We are grateful for your support and look forward to continuing this path with you all. Until next time, take care, stay present and stay connected.